Everyone, welcome back for another episode of National Fire Radio's podcast. Rob, we're back in the studio again. Yes, excited to be here. Yeah, enough about gotta... us. Let's just get right to the guest. Deputy Chief Matt Palmer, Stanford, Connecticut Fire Department. Chief, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're always welcome, man. I, you and I have met uh, a few years ago in Stanford. Yep. I've gotten to know you guys uh, in Stanford, Frank Dosimo and the guys down in the shops. The best. I'm an apparatus guy. They are the best. They are the best. They are. Let's just talk about them for a half a second here. I could talk all for the next hour about them, but right? we'll keep it for a couple the seconds. The guys that keep the apparatus on the road, the guys that keep the equipment fresh, clean, and operating, you have probably some of the best guys I've seen in the market on the stage doing this every single day for you guys no doubt about it yeah and uh again i could talk for days about these guys and what they do uh just the attention to detail uh they're masters you know they're just looking always to make the job better to make the equipment better and i think it's generally underappreciated um by a lot i think people just assume that everyone's like that and they're not uh i agree you know and they're always coming up with clever ways whether it's equipment mounting uh, installation of equipment, uh, and just keeping things running. I mean, I there's, say, there's a tremendous amount of pride in making sure that the apparatus there, no matter what manufacturer produced them, stays on the street for the firefighters and the citizens. And I think that's that's the crazy part of it to me, looking from the, uh, from the outside looking yeah. in. And when you go down and you see it, I mean, he has pictures of all the trucks he's been involved in. I mean, he has pride not just in a job, but in the fleet and the work they're doing, and uh, it's evident. I mean, the, they're the just, pride is off the hook. There. Yeah, and it's and, right on their shirts. You and know. they are incre- It is, yeah, and right they there. are incredibly yeah. welcoming. Uh, we've gotten to know them very well. I've gotten to know Frank very well in the crew there. Um, just incredible gentlemen, and they do great work for you. So, take care of your shops. Take care of the guys in the shops because they're the ones that take care of you. Yep. And, yeah. and don't ever forget about those people. You know, we always focus so much on on the operations division we should but those are the guys that are keeping us moving you got that right yeah absolutely so chief 28 years currently serving as a deputy chief in the city of stanford give me a little rundown on stanford itself size you know type of responses things like that sure the city's about 52 square miles uh we're located in southwestern connecticut about 30 minutes 30 miles outside of manhattan okay uh so we're like in that lower little uh notch of connecticut that you see on a map uh, city population, right, roughly about 135,000 people. Uh, daytime population can pop upwards of 200, 250. Uh, big commuter city. We have a lot of yeah. companies that have relocated from, or still have, they just or, or will move a division outside of Manhattan. Uh, so we have a lot of corporate space. Um, it's still a really neighborhood-dominated uh, city. You know, a lot of people identify themselves by what neighborhood they live in, whether it's Springdale, Glenbrook, Belltown, Chapin. Uh, so it still has that, you know, where the neighborhoods are uh, somewhat independent and uh, people are very, very proud of the neighborhoods where they grew up. So it's, uh, it, that's a cool thing. Um, a big transportation city. We have um, Metro North has, a, has a, probably the biggest stop uh, from between uh, uh, Grand Central and um, New Haven, uh, right there, I-95, Merritt Parkway. I mean, it can be a pretty busy busy. place. Yeah, and very diverse. I mean, it's a city where if you go downtown, if you come through, if you're coming up 95 from Jersey or from from the city, uh, you'll see a lot of high rise, right? You see a lot of development. The city has undergone a a significant transformation in the last 25 years. And conversely, you can run up to the north end of the city, uh, up near the New York border, and you're on properties that, you know, old goat paths and and some big estates, and you sure. would think you were somewhere in Vermont at yeah. times. You know, so it's a very very diverse city. We still have about uh, a significant area up north where we have no hydrants, so we still do tankers. You know, people downtown don't realize that, or people realize Stanford Fire Department does a tanker shuttle, but yeah, we do. We still have areas. Seen in the it city. firsthand. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and and we actually have some very very good uh, videos that have been out on YouTube sure. that we've shared with people and some good process that we've learned from other departments and put together in productions. But yeah, we so we, we're confronted with everything from urban to you know suburban to areas that you know are are, are uh, and you're expanding plus the yeah. sound as well you have the and that. we also have a lot of water quality yeah. Yeah, and this yeah. time of year we're feeling it too because we you know obviously this is a, a big time of year for the boat sure uh and, and you know i probably five six times a week we're getting called out for some sort of uh, some sort of water issue yeah and yeah. and when i just to get back to where i said expanding right I mean, you guys over time have kind of broadened your borders outside of the city, if you will, into other areas and working now hand in hand with the volunteer companies that were in the town of Stanford as well, correct? Yeah, and not an easy process. No, I'm Uh, sure. I got on the job early in 95. Uh, about two years later was the first big move, and that did not go well. Uh, which, which, so the city was c- uh, composed of kind of thirds. Uh, the lower third was the city department. Um, then we had several volunteer companies. 
uh, in the, the, the middle uh, third of the city, and then the upper third was one volunteer company providing protection. Uh, those companies over, over time all had their own career staff. So when I got on the job, there was actually six separate labor contracts with, oh, one, that right? with one union in the city. So you can oh, imagine wow. how the kind of tension that mm -hmm. came from that. Uh, and then it slowly over, it, everyone knew it was going to come. It just was a matter of how willing we were to allow it to come. And, and everybody had their own ways of, of, of how it should look. And so starting in 97, it was the first process tremendous amount of litigation, tremendous amount of fighting, uh, really a civil war that none of us really needed or wanted made us all look bad. Yeah. We've been fortunate since about 2012 that that has settled and it's going very well. Not that there's not some issues, there's always going to be issues with a different groups coming together, but compared to where we were and looking back over the big picture over 20 years, uh, we're, we're doing things that I never thought were, would be possible. Uh, so a lot of credit to all the people over the years that have been working hard to see it through. Uh, we still get hung up on the little problems that happen every day, but the big picture is we've, we've come a long way. And uh, now we have career protection providing throughout the city. Uh, we have generally really good relationships uh, between all the career and volunteer firefighters. And, uh, you know, we're doing things, we're sharing equipment, uh, we're sharing quarters. Uh, so it's, uh, overall, it's a, it's a great success story. Well, that's still, fantastic. It still has a way to go. but Oh, uh, I'm yeah, sure. But yeah. but I, I look at, this is the this is the trend, right? I mean, you guys probably, it, compared to the area I'm from, you guys were kind of ahead of the trend of of expanding out your services and, and starting to piggyback with volunteer departments that's seeing a higher call volume, dropping membership, yep. uh, and so on. And so that's happening now more than ever. And I, I have to think that you guys, well, it's been 10 years since your first uh, move. You said 2012, right? That was uh, when the city charter changed, and that right. gave the city a little bit more authority sure. to make change. Uh, but we, the first move was actually about 25 years ago. That was wow. the very first move. Okay. was was uh, 97. Uh, well, I have to think, yeah. though, over time, right, th typically with time, things get better. They do. I like to think, Absolutely. right? And so, you know, whereas animosity usually happens, whenever there's change, there's animosity very early on. But as it becomes the standard, it's what you know, right? And as guys change, leadership changes, guys promote up the ranks and retire, and you have your new school coming in, that's all they know, right? Mm -hmm. So the system, I have to think, is, is, uh, is really well run, and I've seen it firsthand now uh, by doing some visits with you and, and uh, Chief Morris and a, and a few other guys in Stanford there, and I've gotten to know you guys very well. And I, I just think that it's a, it's a uh, territory that if people have questions or interest in how it melded like it did, I'm sure they could reach out because I'm sure you guys have a lot of information that you could probably assist other departments with uh, in that ex in that you know transition. Yeah, ab and absolutely. And part of the problem is everyone has this sense of it's like a light switch. You're just going to turn it turn it on. Everything's <laughs> yeah. going to work perfectly. But right. This is a generational problem. We knew that this would take generations. And yes, through time, people just get to know that this is normal. So the new firefighters entering our system or the new firefighters coming in as volunteers, this is the system they're going into. So it's easier for them. Right. You know, some of the the old senior firefighters. You know, it was a big change. You sure. Know, it, there was there was some loss. People don't like anything that's going to. You know, it's not it's not that they fear change; they fear loss. Yeah. Right. So anytime someone thinks that there'd be loss, uh, that, that that they get very very suspicious of it, which is understandable. But well, uh, twenty eight years, you probably are one of the more senior guys in the city. Uh, I, I or no? Even, Talk no, to me about that. No. Talk to me about the makeup. No, I think uh, I, I'm probably in getting senior. I, I would never consider myself a senior guy. I mean, that's I, I hate to see you, right? That, yeah, that's, I get it. But we have a department that uh, guys stay, um, you know, whereas a lot of departments have seen a mass exodus or, sure. you know, 25 years, it, it's 25 and out. Uh, our firefighters work. Uh, we have we just had a, a number of uh, senior members leave at 40 years. Oh, no kidding. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be me. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we have so I'm definitely not. Uh, I'm still kind of, uh, you know, probably in that upper two thirds. But uh, uh, we've hired a lot. But compared to some other departments in Connecticut, Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford come to mind where their their average age is significantly lower than ours. Uh, but we, our firefighters have stayed working. Um, and I think it's a tribute to the department. You know, it's it's not a perfect place. We have our problems like anybody else. But generally speaking, it's it's a good job. It's treated me well. It's treated my coworkers well. I, so. I can't imagine just knowing some of the history with the growing, uh, I'll call it growing pains of Stanford like the diplomacy that you had to get in that uh, in, 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 in that uh, time to, you know, really like tactfully approach situations. Cause especially when you, I mean, you said it right here, they don't fear change, they fear loss. So how do you like the back pocket skills to be able to, you know, quell that fear of loss to help change happen is probably, 
I mean, I, I can't imagine what that was like. It, it's a tough gig. Um, before I was promoted deputy chief, I was a captain, and one of the assignments I had was moving into one of the volunteer stations. We had, because of the dispute, we were actually living in a trailer. Right. Uh, and we were there supposedly for a year. It ended up being like seven years. Uh, but at some point, we had to move forward. And they were moving us into what's the Turner River Fire Department had two stations. We were, my company was moving into their station one. That was not easy. No one wanted it from both sides, but it was happening. So being the captain of that station trying to do it, uh, the best thing we could do is just treat each other with respect. And that's easier said than done. Sure. Because I, although I may have that philosophy, a lot of people doesn't maybe mean the work other guy it. does exactly <laughs> you know but we did and we just started with basic communication like anything else in the fire service look we have a common bond we both like the fire service so right. whether we're paid or volunteer we still think this stuff is cool yeah so we can figure out a way and the way we figured it out was just just do training let's come up with some common drills and that's tough too because sometimes from the volunteer side they don't want to show some of their deficiencies and i get that they're not doing it like their we guards are. Up. Yeah. so there's a lot of protection going on yeah. as far as hell what if they think we're inferior no let's just get together Our, we're not perfect too there's things that we have to focus on as well so we started there just doing common training simple things we weren't doing very very robust drills we were just doing basic hose stretches and ladder raises and and we found that after the drill what did we do we started talking right. and we started realizing that like hey you know, a lot of us were more alike than we are. Yeah, different. there's commonality here. There is. Absolutely. And just those conversations. The next thing you know, we are, oh, let's, let's, next month, let's try to do this. Okay, let's get together. Oh, hey, we're going to have, uh, you know, uh, the gas company's coming in to do a drill. You guys mind coming by? Oh, yeah, that's great. It's a great opportunity. We'll come by and we'll sit in on your drill as well. So that just started that. And it just, over time, it didn't happen in a week. It didn't happen in a month, but over the course of a couple well, years. And, and that's the, that's the conversation, right? Is patience. Right. Yep. Everybody lacks patience today. Yep. We're looking for instant change. So when, when changes to happen, we, want like you said before flip a switch and uh, and here's the new change yep. and it just doesn't work and i think that's where it's important to have uh some experience and and uh folks that have been around a little bit longer that maybe understand a little bit better the importance of patience and knows that things take time and that we're not going to be able to make change overnight and i think that that's a lot of the issues that we face today in the fire service is this instant gratification, this instant change that we all want today. We can get answers immediately now. You don't have to be, you don't have to have patience anymore, or, or wait for the long game or the longevity of anything. It's, it's I want it now, and and uh, people lose track of that. So I'm glad that you said that, and I think that's what's important about the whole uh, transition. And you talked about back pocket, Rob. That's it, man. Yeah. It's patience. Yeah. 100% 5% of the pressure 100% of the time or 10% of the pressure 100% yeah. of the time yeah really because like, it, it's that long game yeah that's what we're in it for and you know it's it's really I just I, thanks for sharing that because yeah. I think it's one of those things where a lot of departments are going to have some similar issues and growing pains and it's just keeping that out there for everybody all sides to just be cognizant of yeah. So, Chief, take me back, man. Let's we usually we start off, I mean, we hopped right in, but usually we start off with you know your upbringing, where where the where the love for the fire service came from. I mean, what's fun for us is we get to have guests on here and we get to learn your story, and uh, people trust us with their story, and it means everything to us. But I always like to get to the root of like how you got here, and I don't mean here with us, but I mean here in your career. Um, I, you know, in the quick bio you sent over, uh, I will say your bio is a little more detailed than most, which I love <laughs> because it gives us more to play with. But it also shows how thorough you are. And I, I've gotten yeah. to know you, so I appreciate yeah. that. Um, started at 16 as an explorer and then from there. So, yeah. so I grew up in a town of Guilford, Connecticut. Uh, Guilford is just outside New Haven, about 10 minutes. Uh, we're right on the shoreline. Beautiful town. Yeah. Uh, we had an all volunteer department at the time and now there's I think uh, 45 guys on the job there wow. so that's how much has changed mm -hmm. uh, and when I came in um, you know I didn't at the time I had I think I, I, we were talking before the show and I mentioned my great-grandfather worked for the city of New Haven for 42 years yeah but I didn't know him he had passed away long before I was ever born so I didn't have that kind of presence where somebody in my house both my parents were school teachers Got it. Um, so I didn't have any I didn't have anybody uh, that was mentoring me in the fire service other than friends uh, friends that had parents that were uh, volunteer firefighters sure. in town and then they became junior firefighters so what happened I was 16 years old I just got my driver's license I had time on my hands I was I, I you know this whole world in front of me and one of my friends was a volunteer there was a fire in town I started asking him a lot of questions about it and he said you know if you're interested why don't you come by we have an explorer post that's run through the Boy Scouts 
uh, if you want to, we're having a drill. Why don't you come up and, uh, you know, Thursday night we'll go to the drill. And I went up and, and it just clicked for me. It was like within an hour of this, I was like, wow, man, this is amazing. Yeah, you know, I just felt like, you know, this, this was, this was it for me. And, you know, my parents weren't re real happy with that at the time. Cause I think they had, uh, ambitions of me going on and doing, sure. you know, architecture or something like that. But the fire service was it. That and sounds was, exciting. Yeah. So exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of us have probably had that conversation yeah, with their parents at, sure. at one point in time. I let my but, parents uh, down all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I just started that path. And the more I got into it, the more the more time I spent there, the more I was just totally absorbed by it. And uh, it kept me out of trouble in high school. You know, I had a lot of friends and went on and, and, and weren't doing some stuff. And I could go hang out in the firehouse, you know, and it, right. it, it probably I didn't I don't know if I willingly knew that at the time. But looking back on it, it probably saved me a lot of headache. Uh, a lot of problems that uh, of other friends of mine got into. Yeah, I certainly uh, didn't want to let any of the people in the fire company down either. Because that was always one thing in the back of my mind. If I screw up, I don't want to let the company down in my own behavior. Yeah, outside and, of here. and there was some pretty hardy old souls at the time. And they, they certainly uh, knew how to police the junior members. Yeah. You know, you didn't mess around with them. Uh, and they didn't, ha they didn't hesitate to kind of tell you how to be. How uh, important is that? Like, it, when you look back on that, you ever look back on those on those couple of years there and think, like, how instrumental those guys were in, in providing a base for you to, to grow I, up in? I recall the conversations like they were last night. That's yeah. how, they were harsh. And, yeah. and you needed to hear. It's just like my first boss. You know, I always tell my kids, you wouldn't believe this guy. And God rest his soul. But... The, th the conversations he used to tell us. I mean, it's no different than the firehouse. You know, if, if you stepped on a line, they made sure you knew it. Uh, you know, today you'd probably end up in, in HR or something like that for, for some of the conversations that I was uh, subjected to. You but, would. But, you absolutely oh, would. You would. It was a whole yeah. different animal yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah. But so. I, I just think it's so instrumental. Like, you, you hear a lot of these stories, and, like, I had the same kind of upbringing, and nothing was sugar-coated for me. There were people oh. keeping me in line, and my parents were very much happy with people keeping me yep. in line. Yep. And the guys at the firehouse, like, if you got out of line, they let you know. Yeah. You yeah, know? The, the chief up there was a gentleman by the name of Charles Hershaft. He's still the chief today. He's still going. He's Is now the right? career chief. But I'll tell you what, it's sharp as they come. Yeah. Uh, and he let you know his expectations. And if you fell short, he let you know you, you did it. So uh, I, I'm grateful for those kind of lessons yeah. uh, because uh, they, uh, you know, they gave me a lot of uh, good direction moving forward in the fire service. Yeah. So getting back to, you know, so I, so I got out of high school. And again, to disappoint my parents, I didn't go on to college. Huge mistake. I, people out there don't follow that. Uh, it took me 17 years to get my, my, my degree over to, <laughs> as an adult, so that was a huge mistake. Uh, but uh, so I stayed and I just started taking tests. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate. Uh, I was hired. Um, the town next door had a small career department, town of Brantford. Uh, I was hired in 94 as a career firefighter there. So that was great. To me, that was the world because it was the next door neighbor that had a career department. Got it. And yeah, it was like the like, next step, right? The downside is there was only five of us on the job at the time. One was the boss. There was two guys in the engines and two, guy, two guys on the medic unit. And the medic unit was always out. So, right. you know, you had a structure fire and you had, you know, two on the engine um, in that town. So there wasn't a lot of places for me to go. And because I had gone out taking tests everywhere from Boston to uh, New York, Boston was my spot. Everyone knows I'm a big Boston buff, and I, you know that's a whole other story in itself. But uh, you know, Stanford uh, sent me sent me an offer about six months after I was on the job in Brantford. I knew at the time at Stanford was considerably more money, a lot more opportunity, um, and I didn't know a lot about the city. You know, right. I just knew that it was uh, you know knew where it was. Uh, I didn't have any connections down there. But uh, in January '95. Uh, we started our academy. It was delayed a few times, but we finally uh, finally got it going in the dead of winter. And, uh, you know, I just, I've just i been down there since then, and it's been, you know, just a terrific experience. You know, I was firefighter for, I think, nine years, and then lieutenant for maybe four or five years, and then captain for 12 years, and I've been chief officer now for four I, years. I think that's one thing, when it especially kind of the career fire service, and I just hit on it real quick, the importance of taking the test and and – like not, I don't want to say not settling, but like you started in Brantford, you tested up and down. Oh like, yeah. And there's, I, I mean, I talk to people all the time. We're like, yeah, I want to, I want to get on the job. I want to do this. And I tell them take test everywhere. And they're like, get, they'll get locked into a geographic location. And I feel like they are just doing themselves a disservice. Like, but you know, like how many tests do you think you took when you were I'd in, say, in the mix? I would say probably 20. And again, at the time we didn't have access to the search engines now you had word of mouth oh, yeah. literally and right. you had it you had to build right. a network mm -hmm. and it was a tough network because they were also your competition so you never knew if they were steering you wrong but i can remember 
I can remember yeah. driving to places because someone said, uh, I think it was, uh, I think someone, I uh, think the Bristol, Connecticut Fire Department was hiring. I remember driving all the way up there, and it turned out it was uh, somewhere else in Connecticut with a similar name. Uh, right. You know, because you didn't know. You know, you could pick up the phone, and you might have had someone help for HR, but a lot of times you had to show up, and, you know, it's so it's very, very different. Now, I don't know what it would be like. I think, uh, you know, you have access to jobs from all over the world, emails every day, search engines, apps. Sure. Uh, but at the time, it was all word of mouth, and you had to trust and have a good network of people. I'll say this. For all the guys I tested with, the whole group of people we got, it kind of became our own little society. Uh, everyone went on to the job. The guys that took one test or two tests or didn't want to drive more than five minutes, well, they're doing whatever they're doing now. But, right. you know, so you're right. You have to be somewhat aggressive in your ability to get out there and, 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 and find the time and, and, and do what you have it's to do. It's a full-time job to get yeah. a job. Yep, it is. At least in the Northeast. I mean, here it's, yeah. you know, I know other parts of the country, people leave for more money because the job just doesn't yeah. pay and it's, and it's kind of easier to get that career job because there's such a turnover. Here, it is a career. It's not a job. It's a career in the Northeast, I think. And, and you know, and the, and the, the pay is there, the, uh, the duties there, um, and so on. So, but it, I know kids in my firehouse right now, young kids that are testing anywhere and everywhere they can. Yeah. And they're going to get hired. Yes. You know, they're going to get hired yep. if they have that attitude. But if That's it's right. someone who's very selective, right. or I don't, well, you know, you don't really have, your head's not in it, and it's probably not for you anyways. Yeah. Because when you, if you do get on the job by luck, you're probably not going to be have both feet in, and you're going to be more about benefits, about you know, hey, I get paid on Thursday, rather than sure. believing that this is a, you know something that uh, a special place that you're going to be part of for the next 25 or 30 years. So coming up through 95, you get hired in 95. You go through the academy. How big was your class? We had 20 of us. Oh, nice. Yeah, so is that a good size for Stanford? It, it was at the time. They hadn't yeah. hired in like five years. There actually had been some firefighters laid off before us. There was a, a bunch of political nonsense going yeah. on. Uh, so we were the first class, I think, in four or five years. So there was that. They followed up with a class of 12 and I think three more off of that list. You that, have guys still on the job with you from yeah, your quite original a few. class? Yeah, quite a few. But, yeah. And on a side note, you did. My uncle was a career fireman in uh, Stanford. I can tell you all kinds of stories about I bet you them, can. So. And, you know, yeah. and that's what I love. I, you know, you and I met a few years ago at the shops down by yeah. Frank. And, uh, and then when I said my last name, you were like, oh, my gosh. Like, I, you know, and, uh, and it was just fun to make that connection because it was kind of crazy for me growing up. My uncle was a career fireman for a long time. My father volunteered with him up in Turner River, yeah, the yeah. volunteer house, before my uncle got hired. And then my father moved to New Jersey. Um, and I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. But, um, but he never really talked about the job much. And as a kid growing up who was absolutely in love with the fire service, I wanted to hear him tell me all these great stories. And I never got much from him in regards to the job. Yeah, I think that's, you know, we always say, you know, people who talk a lot have never really done, and people who do don't generally talk. You right. know, we, so it's it's about being somewhat reserved sure, towards sure. the job. I know my kids rarely hear anything about my occupation, and now they're teenagers, they don't really care. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I got to tell you some stories about yeah. his uncle because. Oh, boy, here we go. No, 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 because he, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was a, he was no, a big I'd influence on me. I'd and, love to and, hear him. I'd love to hear him. And so Jeremy's uncle, uh, John Donch, retired as a lieutenant. And John was like an old, traditional, and I don't mean to say old like in a negative way, but I look back kind of like I, I mentioned my first boss about someone who kind of told you the way it was yeah. and they didn't really sugarcoat it and you needed to hear it so here I was <laughs> I had six years on the job I was voted as the president of local president of local 76 I was 29 years old I didn't really even want to tell anybody I was that young and I had six years on the job and I'm here I am the newly elected president of the local we had about 260 270 members on the job yeah. at the time and I've got an executive board, and my executive board is all like 30 years to my senior. And <laughs> your uncle's one of them. Oh, no so you can imagine these executive yeah. board. I mean, there's 10 of us on the executive board. Here I am sitting at the end, and I'm the kid. And uh, I think there was one other member who had like five years, uh, about five years to my senior. But everybody else were, were 30-year members of the, uh, of the job in the local. So you can think the culture shock that I had to adjust to. So here's this kid that thinks he knows everything, and and I've got those guys. I'm looking down at the table, and I'm looking down like guys like Jackie Coughlin, who was who was who was a great guy, and George Barron, God rest his soul. These traditional, you know, really staunch union guys, and here I am pumping up all this all these ideas, and they're just looking, staring you down, like just and yeah. And, and they had such a sense of tradi you know, uh, of the department. And the one thing that's really changed, and the thing I respect about them, is that they never let the chief, the mayor, all those other outside influences ever tarnish the department. Um, that's different now. Uh, we allow people to crap on the department, and it's not acceptable. 
but they didn't. They always knew that the department was bigger than whoever was in elected office, whoever was on the board of finance, and all the other people that sometimes make sure. our lives difficult, uh, or even a chief officer. Yep, they I always, always respected the job, and, and that's something I'll never, you know, I, that I learned from them is that you never ever lose sight of the, that the job is bigger than all of us, and no matter what we're facing, don't ever disrespect the job. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't think that exists as much as it should now. So he was a really, really good role model. He was a funny guy, uh, but uh, we certainly had our share of, of disagreements, and I love him now. <laughs> so he's, he's still going strong. I think I talked to him about a year ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, he's still working, trying to work for the retirees, trying to work on some some pension issues and stuff like that. So he's still doing it. He's still trying. That's good. And uh, he was definitely a good influence, and I appreciate the time I had with yeah, him. He, yeah, I know he loved the job. I know he, was, he very much loved the job, um, and I know he was a hard-hitting dude. You know? Yeah, he was. He yeah. was. Yeah, he, he he threw some pretty good punches at me, so <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> so we don't, we don't ever really talk about the union too much uh, just because I don't think the opportunities really come up. But can you talk, just hit real quickly on what it is to be a, a younger person in the job and to be involved in the union? Because I think that there's a lot of notions out there, but it's just it's not just contract. It's there's something just it's, it's much more to that. Like. Do you, can, can you speak on like being young and being involved? Because I think it's one thing we struggle with now is having getting people that are younger involved and getting them involved for the right reasons. Yeah, it's the union is an outstanding fraternal benefit. We do some great things. My local is very, very active, uh, both internally and externally. So we have everything from member assistance. Our members fall in hard times. You know, our union has has a fund if a guy's going through a tough time or has a problem with a sick child. Uh, you know, we have some really, really good programs that take a lot of time and uh, energy to put into, but the union's also very involved in everything from sponsoring Little League teams to uh, local, other local charities to giving away, uh, you know, helping with smoke detector installations. So there, it, it's hard, but it takes a lot of people and it takes... Uh, we have a 10-member executive board, but there's a lot of other subcommittees that take time. And, and I know they struggle. I, I, I see now just trying to get the golf tournament going. Yeah. Years ago, yeah. you put the golf tournament on, it was sold out in, in an hour. You know, 144 spots, boom, it's done. Now they, I, I watch these guys struggle and beg. And so it, it's hard with younger people. It's, it's also hard they don't have time. Guys have kids. They're both working. Uh, spouses are working, um, but uh, it takes a lot of manpower and keeping everybody involved. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly met some great people. Uh, my time with the union, I, I, I spent two years afterwards as a legislative rep. Uh, so I think all told I had seven or eight years of service uh, on the board. I haven't been involved in a number of years, but uh, I also met some great people. Um, you know, Eddie Kelly, who's now the general president of the IFF. I met Eddie uh, in San Antonio, Texas at a bar. He had just been uh, elected president of Local 718. And here, here we are in a bar and just a good guy talking to him, listen to his aspirations within his own local, never realizing now today he's the president of the International Association of Fire yeah, Parts. Pretty right. cool, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. You're watching a lot of people and just a great network of people that you've watched grow up in the fire service and are still, you know, some of your contacts today. So no, that's awesome. Cool. So good. Thank you. Yeah. So, all right. So let's circle back a little bit because I want to hop into your career. You know, we, we kind of went off on a few tangents, yeah. but <laughs> Stanford itself it's gone through a lot of change. Sure. And so has your department, yeah, right? Absolutely. So being there and now being in, um, well, let's talk about your favorite spot in the department. I mean, was it a far, was it a backstep fireman? Was it a, was it a boss? Was it a ch your chief position? You were deputy chief of training for several years, which allows you to uh, be a part of the culture shift or changes or uh, installation of new types of training or uh, things like that. So, is it the mindset? Is the physical firefighting? Like, what what part of that job and what position really fueled you and, and oh. really... Yeah, what was that roller coaster moment? Yeah, where yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. look, the favorite part is ride backwards, sure. right? There's nothing better than riding backwards. Okay. You know, catching a job first due, good stretch, no problems, and maybe it's a room and content, maybe two room and contents. That's the best. And how job. was Stanford yeah. when you came out of the academy your first couple of years on the back step? I mean, were you guys going to work? Uh, cities changed a lot. I mean, yeah. I started in the old South End Firehouse, which is still there, but we're not occupying it anymore. Um, you, we always say, oh, there were so many more fires. You know, years ago, that, that's what my generation, that's what the generation it. before yeah. me. Was there a lot? I mean, Stanford's not some of these other cities, but we certainly had our share of opportunities. Sure. Uh, we went to a lot of good jobs. We worked with a lot of good senior firefighters that taught us some good things. 
Um, and, you know, I think those were the best years. You know, I had a lot of times. As you go up the ladder, you become a lieutenant, you know, your job changes. You know, you yeah. start, you know, it's, it, I won't say it's not as fun because the job's still just as fun today, uh, even as a chief officer, as it was in April of 95 when I first, you know, got out of the academy and, and had my first shift. Uh, but those were the good days. You know, they were really fun. We were young, you know time and life hadn't affected us you know we had everything in front of Get us it. you know so uh we're always going to look back on those days as being some of the best days but I'll, you mentioned the deputy chief of training yeah. and when i was promoted about five years ago uh, to deputy chief i started in the training for three years and i didn't go into that job I, you know I, I was a little skeptical i wasn't really sure what to expect and i gotta tell you i, I love that job did you um you know part, unfortunately with, in our contract you know there's a, there's a thing known as overtime and and, and something that, that doesn't have and so i kind of migrated out of that when i could because of finances finances I but i i look back on that job and talk about the ability to influence you know the organization and create change you can do it there yes uh, and also networking and meeting people and working across the state and working with other training officers and other chief officers um, really really good opportunity and this was just as COVID happened right so I had only about a year in training I was also the health and safety officer for the department and all of a sudden COVID comes in right yeah. and COVID starts in New Rochelle New York on the east yeah, coast yeah right we, around we the corner of, from you right around the corner yeah. so of course it's quickly and Stanford became by March 15th of 2000 uh, you know COVID central so it was a great experience and I, I don't mean that you know I mean as far as having to to endure that and weather it and come up with process procedures some of which I would question whether it was the best best practice now but at the time we didn't know better well, you didn't and know. Right. yeah we didn't know I mean now I'll criticize even some of the stuff that I signed off on is probably not necessary but that's that you know there is a learning process that goes on with this uh, but that was, uh, you know, it, it was a uh, certainly an interesting time. Something we'll always look back upon and try to really decide, you know, what what we what we did right, what we could have done better, uh, what we can do right in the future. Uh, but uh, the training job was was definitely one. How was I, the how was the culture in Stanford prior to you getting into that position? I mean, the, the training was tra is training always a priority? I mean, I know some some cities are much more proactive in their training than others, um, and so on. But for you to come into that position. I mean, did you have a blank canvas? Were you afforded the opportunity to make changes and still different things? I, I did. I don't think anybody ever clipped my wings. Right. Uh, we had a chief who was there, uh, Tim Conroy, great senior chief. Uh, I mean, truly, you're, you know, you talk about command presence, you know, the six foot four. I mean, he looked like he was out of central casting for fire chiefs, and, and, and he behaved that, that way. Yeah, yeah he was. He was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, was a, he was truly a, he was a great fire chief, uh, deputy fire chief, and he had been in training. He had been uh, retired, so the position was vacant for about two years before I filled it. So one of the problems with training in any organization is recruiting members into it. We always, you know, say we how much we need training, but we don't ever financially back it. We always do things that make it harder for members to stay there, you know, and, and I hate to get dive into issues of labor issues here, but, you know, we don't do a lot to really entice people to stay there you know so most of the people who go there it's by seniority you know you're a junior captain you're going to go to training you're a junior uh deputy chief you're going to go to training so and you, we have to do more to encourage and make those jobs more envi enviable so people will stay in them um because that's 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 the same in all organizations it's rare that you find a place where everybody kind of rushes to training uh most of them just kind of pass through on their on their seniority time and uh um, you know, in, in our place, it's the same way. And I'm not trying to throw stones at it, but that no, is a I get it. In, in all in, fire departments. In, in, and through our travels, I mean, we, we've been across the country and visited with so many different fire departments. And a lot of times we end up talking with the training chief. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, man, I'm excited for that because we have met so many incredible men and women across the country that are in that position now. And, and what you're saying is what I think the older school mentality was of like you got to do your stint and you just you ride your way through the you know through the training spot to get back out into the into the wild again but we're seeing like i've met so many incredible and dynamic and yes. and proactive uh training staff or chiefs in charge of training that are there to better they're bettering themselves so that they can better their department uh, which is exciting to see it's a culture yeah. shift i i think the example that just comes to mind that's like just so bright is what we saw in the woodlands the woodlands i was i was gonna say that in texas absolutely yeah. he was he was stellar it was a young chief excited about training mm -hmm. he travels all over to better himself so he can learn and bring it back i think a lot of times you talk about training most training chiefs or most people in the training bureau are done learning mm -hmm. yeah they stop learning and and i i 
struggle with that because I look at like our local fire academies now that are, are that are teaching the firefighter one course, and you look at some of these fire instructors haven't been on a fire engine in thirty years, right. and and they're teaching tactics and considerations and basics, but things have changed. You, the the instructor staff and the people that are making those decisions need to change with the times. Yeah, and the idea of lifelong le learning always sounds like something good that someone says in a speech, right, or, right, you know, right, but right, they don't right. always live out that. Ah, and I think it's true. And I, I look at myself, I, one of the things that training exposed to me was how much I had forgotten. And when you run an academy, yeah. that's the thing. When I ran a couple of academies and I oversaw that, I should say, ran, I oversaw that and I had some really, really good people that were doing the day-to-day -day operations. But you sit in there and you go down there and you watch and you realize, my God, just basic things with hydraulics and hose stretches and tactics, or you realize that things change. We have a, a younger guy, Nick D'Angelo, just as great, he's about seven, eight years on the job and he's, he's gonna be an, a hell of a fire officer, but he's out there uh, out at, uh, outside of India, I'm trying to think, I think it's McCormick's place, he's out at mm -hmm. that school, he's up in Seattle, I mean, he's teaching all that. Fire and, department and, training and network. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, those Jim guys McCormick's are out place. there and they're showing you things, and look, a lot of the, some of the techniques they're doing, does it work for everybody? No, because not everybody's on the same page and you can't have one guy doing this and another guy's a senior guy, but just some, if you take little bits of what they're That's teaching, right. it's, it's pretty right. amazing. And you're looking at it, it's like, hey, there are better ways. You know, we are learning, we are evolving. So I love to see that and I was exposed to that all the time in training and it's stuff that I had just forgotten because I just, I'm not exposed to that anymore. You yeah, know? So, and, and I wanted to piggyback too, Chief, on something you said, because I, I find that we struggle so much. Recruitment's not so much the problem, it's the retention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I think, to me, is we need to do a better job and focus now more than ever, focus on our people that are in front of us and, and also institute a culture and the abilities to give our people what they need so that that becomes then the recruitment. When you can retain your people and endorse your people, the people will come. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And retention is a big deal, particularly on the volunteer side of the equation. Uh, how many organizations invest heavily through Fire One, Fire Two to get people in the door? And, you know, a year later, two years later, three years later, they're just not showing up anymore. So, the, and, and the same thing goes with, with there's career departments that have, uh, fortunately, the department I work for does not. Uh, we lose very few people over the, over the course right. of uh, my career. I've seen very few people leave and it's usually for, you know, someone has a great gig and they're going to sure. make millions of dollars and it doesn't always work <laughs> out that way. But uh, for the most part, or they're going down to FDNY or, or some organiza larger organization like that. But there are uh, a lot of departments, particularly in the state of Connecticut where I'm from, uh, that are losing people and it's a big deal. Uh, and you know, it, I, I, as a fire chief, you know, the last thing you want to do is go through the whole process of bringing someone on, yeah, which is right. not easy, training them, orient, getting them oriented to, uh, orientated to the department. And then, you know, two years later they leave because there's not a pension or they leave because, you know, there's no forward, uh, upward advancement for them. Well, even like, I think the job market is going, is changing because I know my boss freaked out. My chief, like his eyes went wide when I was telling him about an opportunity that was in Virginia, and they were looking for walk-on lieutenants and captains. Yeah, uh, Georgia, same thing. They were, yeah. you know, like, and he's like, "Are you?" I said, "No, no, I got one year and six months before I hit my 20s. So first off, we're not going to leave until that. Yeah. Uh, but two, like it's like the fire service, like the, the even the number of people applicants testing on the career side is down considerably versus when I took the test back in 2001, and like we have to think about that, like re the retention. We also have to think about the recruitment because we don't, uh, at least I'm seeing it in other areas of the country where there used to have thousands. And I think uh, somebody told me there was a place in Virginia that usually had three to 4,000 tests and they were like 600. Yeah. And, and that was just our case. We just got done having a test, and we were fortunate. We, I think we came in around 800 that sat. We used to get 2,000, 3,000 for the test, and we were, I was figuring we were going to be around 500 because other cities in Connecticut had that same problem. Bridgeport had gone out. Uh, I and, took and, that Stanford yeah. test at the high school back in probably 95-ish. And you would have seen right probably several then. different sessions, maybe a couple different days of offering. Yeah. And now you can look, there's departments in, I mean, all over the country you look. And, yeah. and I just got back, I was at the National Fire Academy the last two weeks. Which I wanted to talk so about. We too, could talk, so but, but I was with chiefs from all over the country and we were talking about, it, and I don't care if you're in Southern California, if you're in Georgia, or if you're in New Jersey, they're all having that issue. Now, yes. the question we have to ask ourselves, is this just an anomaly? Is this just a little blip on the radar that's telling us, you know, post-COVID, 
we what COVID made getting you know for not certainly for me but for a generation um, younger than me that you know working from the foot of your bed is the way to be right you see that you know you, you get yourself a little dog you live in a little studio apartment and you're going to work from the foot of your bed and make 10 million dollars a year That's that right. became like you know enviable to the point where I'm telling my kids like don't do that you know you got you guys got to have a skill um, but there's a whole generation and I think we're seeing the results of that kind of mentality now translate to the fire service where you're not seeing those numbers so we don't know uh, and I hate to get, be very vague with that, but that may be correcting. We, we may see yeah. that come back in years. If not, we are really have some concerns we have to be prepared for. But we do have to look at it now. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that I, I'm just from the sake of the discussion, I think we're going to – I'm afraid it's going to be a long-lasting problem. I, yeah. my, my personal opinion mm -hmm. of how I've watched the list change and, uh, you know, just across the country, I, I'm paying attention to it. Um, it seems like this is going to be – because it's not just – uh, one area that like the department's having an issue there's there's that but then there's also departments that are oh man we've had tremendous growth in our county and we need to put six stations on yeah. with the staffing so I, I just I, I think it's going to be a, a problem nationwide for the next couple of years I'm like do you do you feel that or you just you wouldn't say or I, I'm definitely concerned but I still think we're going to draw people into the fire service and maybe yeah the numbers will cut out some of the people that truly didn't want to weren't really into the fire department or maybe they just were attracted by the fact that hey i know a fireman and he works Eight you know a month, yeah, really. yeah exactly those so kind of which quite honestly if they're not if they're not showing up anymore that's fine because that's that's yeah. a problem that's been a problem for people who were attracted to the fire service for the wrong reasons um but i'm definitely concerned but i just want to give it a little more time to see if if it doesn't start to correct itself a little bit yeah so. Talk to me about the National Fire Academy, right? So, you know, we talked about furthering education. You were in a position. Now you're back on the road, which I'm sure you're yep, enjoying. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. Shift commander I now, do, right? So It's been a good opportunity. It's a pretty yeah, good gig, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's probably one of the better seats in the, in the city, I'm sure, right? Yeah, it, it's certainly not. Yeah. It's certainly not without out its frustration. <laughs> oh, of right? course, of yeah, course. Yeah, there there are no easy days anymore. But you're but. still furthering your education 28 years in, and and Absolutely. things like taking advantage of the opportunities to go to places like the National Fire Academy. Just speak to that a little bit. You know what what that means to you, and then the relationships that come out of that, and the the educational piece that is there as well. Yeah. So I I just literally got back some, uh, Friday. Um, from two weeks down at the National Fire wow. Academy, which I'll be the first to admit, this was my first day there. Um, I've been in the fire service, you know, over 35 years of service now, and that was the first time I sure. actually stayed on campus and took courses there. So I'm just as, I'm somewhat ignorant to what the National Fire Academy is all about. Now, the reason why I was there is I'm part of the, the, the new class for the Executive Fire Officer Program, which is a fantastic program. Um, I was very fortunate. There was two classes. This was the entry. The first class you go in under EFO. There's five modules that we're that we're we're going to have to achieve over the next probably three to four years, uh, depending on the academy schedule when it gets locked down as far as when they're going to offer all the courses we need. But this was your first on site, which is for two weeks, and it seems like two weeks seems like oh my god, it's going to be an eternity. And the first right. day I got down there, I'm like, oh, this is going to be awful. Yeah, be you know, you just like you know just watching the clock. But I will say. I was with 12 of probably the, some of the finest fire officers in this country, and I was the only guy from the Northeast. I'm sorry, there was one, Jim Smith, who's chief of Ocean City, Maryland, uh, Ocean City, New Jersey, sorry, Jim, um, uh, was also in a class. And But outside of him, him and I, there was really nobody else from the Northeast. So we had people from Southern California, from Oklahoma, from Georgia, from South Carolina, from Illinois, from Wisconsin. So it was this great cross-reference of people who were all like me. They were all deputy chiefs, some were chiefs, all had around the same time in the fire service, all really, really kept wanting to learn and understand more. And we wanted to learn from each other. We had two fantastic instructors, um, a chief from a retired chief from New Jersey and Daryl Jones, who's still the current chief in Pittsburgh. So we had two fantastic instructors leading us, but we spent two weeks just talking about issues. And, and there's plenty of curriculum that went on as well and a lot of work. Anyone who thinks that we're just down there having a vacation yeah, right, right, would have right. been very, very uh, disappointed. But uh, we, we, we learned a lot from each other. And I, I just found these, just, just some of the, my, my classmates to be just, you know, just listening to them do problem solving and, and listen to their challenges. And we also realized like we're all in this together. You know, yeah. we mentioned before the 
show, we were talking about this great talent pool that exists in the tri-state area. And we have this great feeder of the FDNY that gives us some really, really great uh, experience and, and people with that uh, in the fire service, but all across our country. I realized, you know, the guy, the guys coming out of LA or, uh, you know, coming out of, out of Atlanta. I mean, there, there, there are some really, really talented people out there in this country. We just don't, I don't always get the exposure to them. So the NFA gives me that exposure and I'll say this to everybody because I, you know, I, I wanted to go down there hating it. I just, you know, I just the whole concept and uh, even though I applied for it and stuff like that, and I'll say this, I, uh, you know, it is such an underutilized resource and there's some great programming down there. And for us in this area, the Northeast, you know, it's a five hour drive for me, for guys from Jersey, sure. it's a three hour drive and it's something that we really should utilize more because I think it's, and I'll tell you, it's, it's really underutilized by the fire service. Yeah. You know? And the relationships that come with it. I mean, you have a sounding board now of peers that you can lean on at any time now for any issue that you might come across in your career. Absolutely, and moving forward, we're going to be in this program together. There's yeah. about a, there's about a hundred students who started this year all together, um, and so we're going to be taking various classes together. Uh, and so you do, but the whole point of besides making yourself a better officer and continuing to learn, but is building that network. So when your problems come up, you know, whether it's, you know, what's the big concern right now? We're all, we're worried about electric vehicles and how, what are the best practice for EV going to be, you know, so you can start picking the brain and talking to a guy in Southern California, what are you guys doing for that? You know, big thing for us is command, right. you know, how we transition command fire chief in um, Corona, California. He runs his entire command from the front seat of his truck. For yep. me, that would be absurd. How could you run a fire from the front seat? But I talk to repeat, you know, different chiefs from California, and for them, they're looking at standing in front of the building. That's absurd. So, yeah, right. look, we're, it's the same job, and I can't fault them for doing it differently, and I, I appreciate learning from them. And as they put it, hey, look, we run wildfires, and we're not standing in the middle of the wildfire when we're running it, right? <laughs> so so they do have some good points as to how they can do incident management, you know, in a setting, even though it sounds very foreign to me. But I'm always willing to keep my ears open and understand that they're doing this every day and they're doing it well uh, so there's no reason why I can't at least consider looking at change in my ways as well uh, I was going to ask you the executive fire officer program what what is it like I mean it's it sounds very grandiose like it's got a good name but like what what are what's so, the, the I don't want to say, say the purpose but what's the objective of, of going to this program what so EFO has been around for a number of years they just changed the curriculum there is what's called the legacy program which stopped last year and now this year just started their new generation I don't know what they're gonna actually call it if uh, but this is the the, the entire new curriculum uh, it used to be a four-year program now they're looking at ways to try to make it a little bit more same curriculum but try to get it going a little bit faster but the program is designed for developing uh, chief deputy chief officers into chiefs of, of or chief officers into being um, uh, better chief officers for no other way of saying it. Um, but it, in order to apply, there's a bunch of curriculum. You have to have your bachelor's degree. They look at GPA. They look at your length of service. Um, right now, you have to be a deputy chief or above or an administrative chief or above within an organization. So they're not, unfortunately, and the, 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 the problem is it, a lot of the times, by the times a chief is done training, they may be ready to retire. So ideally, you'd love to capture a captain who's, you know, right. who's, who's aspiring to be a chief to get in the program. I don't think that the program will allow it now because there's such competition to get into it. We were told about 1,200 applicants wow. for this year's class, and they let about 100 in. So you're, you know, you're only letting about 10% in, yeah. uh, which is cool for us that got in. Hell yeah, uh, man. But, uh, it speaks but, to your tenure. It you know, speaks but, to your experience. And sitting in the room I was with, you know, and by no means I was far from the smartest person in the room I actually felt like times like well, well, why am I here because I was with some really really sharp people and and I, and I love listening to them I love you know and we became fast friends and I think for the most part the other thing you're walking away we talk about networks but it's also friendships you know I, yeah. I you know you're gonna you're gonna walk away with people that you know hopefully I'm going to their promotions when they become chief hopefully you know we, we keep those relationships up and awesome. you know and it not, fuels you you yeah. go back to Stanford and you're ready to go man yeah but the guys don't want to hear that right well, <laughs> like, I, like oh he's, he's back sure. he's back from the NFA for guys, sure you know, but, but for your own but, every Every yeah. day when you get out of bed and put your feet on the carpet yeah. and it's time to get going. I mean, it's it's experiences like that that fuel you to want to make this job better. Yeah, and I think that's the point. You know, we, we keep saying lifelong learners. And, you know, I mentioned uh, Chief Jones out of, out of Pittsburgh. He's a guy who's, you know, he certainly could leave at any point in time. He's an incredible story. He'd be a great guy to get on yeah, the show great. at some point. Uh, and a really, really funny guy to listen to, to tell stories. But, you know, he says the same thing. You know, when, when they close my casket, I'm gonna, you're going to find me with a book in my hand. You know, here's a fire chief of a 700-person organization, you know, wow. local one, proud, yeah. proud, proud, proud fire department. And he's, you know, promoting the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm always going to have a book in my hand. I always want to figure out how to do this better. Uh, so I, I think that's important. Cool. You know, I think what? I think I think too many people. Anybody who ever says, you know, I, I know everything, kid. You know, no, we don't. Uh, you know, there's there's nobody 
boosting you guys up either. Like, if I wanted to become a fire officer tomorrow, there's hundreds of class tracks I can probably find in the country to become a lieutenant or a company officer or a captain. But when you start getting to that chief level, I feel like the enthusiasm starts to drop off, uh, especially in the training. So I think because like nobody, like nobody's taught me how to look at a budget yet, right? Like I don't have. I, I took the deputy chief's test, but there was nothing on the test about operating a budget or finance or any of the personnel issues that are truly going to come up especially in today's day and age and these are just some things from my own observation uh it was you know the scenarios were based on a like a, a warehouse type fire it was actually it reminded me of the charleston incident um and then a lot of reading comprehension but there was nothing to me I, like i look at what my previous chiefs and chiefs i know and what they've dealt with on a day-to-day and like uh, talking to Mike Turpak as an example, like they're, they're just Great guy. Yeah. nothing in that exam booklet from New York State was anything that I know of what a deputy yeah. chief is. Like, and it was actually it covered the one percent of, of running a fire incident or an emergency incident, but it didn't go into that. So I think it's great that you've gotten to this program because it doesn't seem like there's anything out there to really boost up a fire chief once once they've or a chief once they're getting into that position. Yeah, and on top, ironically, you mentioned the budgeting issue because it, it should scare out hell out all of us. And and look, look, the firefighter listening to the show is like, I don't want to know about budgets, but at some point, if you stay in the game long enough, you're going to have to learn because that's a reality. And there's actually a class, and it was going on last week. That's it's a six-day class that specifically deals with that. So it's it's and again. I, I was just as ignorant, not realizing, oh, wow, they have a class on that. They have two, t- two instructors who are fantastic at teaching very, very dry material yeah. and making it workable for right. people. Because, look, that's that's not easy stuff to sit through. Uh, it's worse than having to listen to me uh, on National Fire Radio for an hour or so. But, uh, <laughs> but, we might, uh, go, we yeah. might give you more than an hour. You're <laughs> doing pretty well, <laughs> Chief. So, yeah. so but, uh, yeah, so it, it's, a, it's an incredibly undervalued resource, and I think all of us should just look at it. And, and on top of it, it's a good place. If nothing else, you're going to go there and you're going to be exposed to firefighters yeah. from outside your normal area area and you might make some friends and you might even learn something about other operations that you didn't think were possible got it so awesome. well good deal i mean uh, th- that's it man furthering yourself making yourself better which makes the job better right if yeah. you're in a good place you bring that to the job the job gets better yeah yeah agreed. Yeah, absolutely. so let's get you back on the street right city of stanford we talked about it early on right the makeup of the city and so on Notable uh, incidents. I know you guys have had a few over the past few years that I've known you. Yep. Uh, one in particular, which I thought was of great interest that I wanted to talk about. And so let's get back to the street view of what you do on a regular basis as the citywide tour commander. Uh, take me back to that uh, submerged vehicle during a snowstorm in the uh, in the sound. So that was February 1st, 2021. Um, we had a nor'easter coming in. I actually came in early that day. Uh, group one was a group before they had a fire. Uh, they called me back at like four in the morning. So, you know, I'm driving in the snow. It's, you know, the storm started early. You knew it was going to be a crappy day, you yep. know? So, you know, and I live about an hour away, so it's a, it's a rough ride in for me. Uh, we get in normal shift and, you know, for us, nor'easters are not that uncommon, no different than for you guys in Jersey or in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're used to them, but being on sound, you know, anything's possible. We got to watch the tide. We've got to watch, you know, the wind. Um, but it started like a regular day. Snow was coming down pretty good. Uh, we had probably six, seven inches on the ground. Most people stay home. I mean, you know, a lot of times with nor'easters is if we, we know they're coming. So a lot of schools going to close, works, work, workplaces will close. So a lot of people are going to, uh, and this was also during COVID, too, still a COVID yeah. time. So a lot of, you, you didn't have a lot of people on the road, but you had your normal calls, you know, power lines down, something arcing tree down, a couple of fire alarms and, you know, everybody's moving slow. You got tires on all the, on, on all, on all the uh, rigs. So we get a call around, I want to say about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so middle of the afternoon, for a report of a truck in the water. And, you know, you're like, well, maybe it was somebody dumped a car off. They stole it. Uh, It's in a city park. There's a boat ramp not too far from there. And... um, we, we came out of headquarters. As usual, you know, there were some issues with dispatch trying to get the right resources on there, so we had to make some quick corrections and make sure we had enough companies responding to the appropriate resources. As Murphy's Law would have it, the rescue was tied up on a technical elevator job that they were doing, so, you know, so the rescue was a little delayed. I came out of headquarters, so I had the, because the rescue was initially not on the box, uh, our tower ladder truck one at, at a headquarters, which is a 95-foot uh, aerial scope, was coming with me to replace the rescue. The rescue, as soon as they signed on, you know, put, uh, as soon as they heard a call, got cleared off their job and 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 jumped onto it so we had plenty of plenty of help coming but um we were uh you know my first thinking uh as an incident commander is you know trying to you know 
what, what, what kind of play do we have? How far is the vehicle? You know, is this a vehicle in the water that was dumped or is this a truck that's, you know, yeah. you know, and I was not expecting what I found, but I'm starting to think, and I'm thinking like, you know, <laughs> I got tr <laughs> truck ones right in front of me. I'm staring at the bucket as we're going down the road and we're moving kind of slow. It's about maybe about a mile to, to the, to the park where we're heading. Uh, and I'm thinking like, man, maybe we can use the, maybe use the tower ladder, you know, depending yeah. on where this vehicle is located. Fortunately, and I mentioned them early, but, uh, Frank Dosimo Jr., who's our mechanical supervisor, he was out plowing snow. Our, our mechanical division during snow storms, they, you know, they get, they, they have three plow trucks and they're out plowing firehouses right. or plowing mm -hmm. drill field. And Frankie's listening to the radio and he hears the same call going on. It's an interesting call. Everyone's listening. And he immediately take, leaves the dr drill field where he's plowing, um, just came back. I think it was refueling or something. And heads right over there. He gets there in about probably a minute, gets on scene, yeah. tells me a good size up, you know, and confirms that I have a truck not 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 just on the edge, but it's floating, yeah. you know, and it's out right. there and it's in there. And I, there's there's so many in it, you know. So I'm like, wow, it's, you know, that's this is odd, you know. So, I, you know, my first thing I asked him was, hey, Frank, you think we can use t truck one and, and get them with the boom? Are they close enough? And he does a quick assessment, says to me, says, um, comes back in the air, goes, I think so. OK, so all right. So I, I let truck one, truck one get as close as you can, which is right. a tough call because yeah. now we're rolling up and we're not on pavement anymore. We're on eight inches of grass and snow and it was a very, very high tide that had just come up. It was just starting to go back. So I don't know underneath that snow. I don't know sure. what's going on there. That's so right. now I'm putting a you know 76,000 pound tower ladder on snow on soft ground right on the edge of the sound just to try to get every inch I can out of it. And um, the... Uh, you know, so it's a tough call. Fortunately, Frank was heads up, as he always is. You know, he, he took his plow truck and he just plowed, he plowed as much, he plowed a path to where he thought would be the best place for the truck. So he got it in there. We got truck one, told him, hey, just get up there, get as close as you can. I don't care what you have to do. We have a known life hazard. As I was coming in over, there's a hurricane barrier. I could see a woman in the back coming out of the back window. So I'm like, all right, I have guaranteed life hazard here. So now we're going to risk a lot to save so a lot. The back window know? was kicked out already. Uh, the, it was, so truck. it was a small sliding window. Oh, okay. And I... Um, they lost power to the truck, right? Truck gets in the salt water, it power craps out, sure. so they can't, they can't get, so that back, that must have been a salt, it must not have been a power window. So you had slid it open, but it's only like a 12 by sure. 12 little I'm window. Not getting this, through it. this is a Chevy, no, none of us are getting through that. I don't care, you know, <laughs> she was very petite, so she yeah. could get through it. So, you know, we see her there, so we're like, all right, we, you know, we got, we got a legitimate rescue going on here. And as soon as I got out, we came out, I got right to the shore. First thing I want to do from her is, anybody else in a truck with her and i'm figuring you know she was very calm she's like oh yeah there's a guy in the front seat i'm like well, what's he doing because i figured i at least see you know him trying to get out of the truck and he was you know there was no motion i, was, I mean okay? the front end of the truck is submerged oh it's it's going down and the, yeah and it's the, it's, the it's, bed and, of the pickup and the rear window to the cab yep. is exposed right everything else is underwater yeah the whole front end is underwater yeah. and, and the worst is the tide's going out it's like that kind of you know that's it the the it was frozen in a lot of places, but where the truck went in, there was all broken ice around it. Yeah. It's jet black water, and the truck's like slowly going away from shore. So now we're losing that effective reach. You know, every second's going on. So uh, Alessio Carenti, who was driving the, the truck one, who I can't say enough about, his, his he's probably one of the finest truck operators I, I, I've seen. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, Frank cleared a path. Alessio gets right up. He drops that truck. He drops the jacks right there. Doesn't even, you know, not even hesitate and gets it up there, and he's got that truck swinging over. Uh, Adam Fullove, who was in the bucket, he's he's going over. He's you know they're positioning the bucket to go out and pick her off. Um, and at that point, the rescue's rolling up. We're fortunate. Our heavy rescue, we always have at least two divers on, hopefully more. Yeah. Uh, so we are you know we are a staff 24/7, 365 dive team. So our divers are coming up. Engine two came in. They had their cold water suits. I had told the guys getting coming in all companies, you make sure your cold water suits are ready to go. And you know the guys just worked fast and flawlessly yeah. you know you know we had a game i had a game plan in my head and you can have every plan in the world in your head and getting it to the vision to reality in the field isn't always easy you know and you say things and guys sometimes don't always understand what you're telling them but this case i mean this was like ex everyone knew what we had to do and they did it very very quickly so they swung truck one out they were just i mean that thing was creaking it, it was right at capacity to pick her off they got her without issue and then we had to focus on getting him out and the problem is as soon as she came off the back of that truck, that truck went from just like slowly submerging to like hyper submerge. I mean, yeah. it, you know, I'm, and I'm sitting on the shore watching this and I can see him now in the back window thinking like, this is gonna be tough. You know, we're gonna have to smash at a window. At that point, I had three cold water, uh, three firefighters, um, 
uh, one from truck one, two from engine two that were in the water, Chad Titus, uh, Brian Rosario and John Calandra were all in the water in the cold water suits and they're grabbing a Halligan bar and they're just trying to break glass to get this guy out because they're seeing the same thing I am. Yeah, this, yeah, truck, right. this truck's, truck's going, going fast. Yeah. And we're literally watching it and as I'm watching this truck is going real fast now and they're swinging and now they're making these swings. You know, the truck's mostly underwater and they're bouncing it. You know, look, it's easy to break a window in a parking lot, but now <laughs> yeah. you're breaking in, bla in black water in the middle of a nor'easter, you know, 30 mile an hour winds, you're in choppy, you know, broken ice water, and they're swinging underwater trying to get that uh, window to break. And it's, you can tell it's literally bouncing off the window. Uh, so just literally at the last, as that truck fully submerged, Brian Rosario took one swing at that back window and John Calandro, who's, Johnny's a not a big guy. He's a very petite, very soft-spoken, really, really humble, great guy. And he's grabs onto the guy, and he's he's got that guy's arm through that little tiny window, and he's holding him like this. And I watch, and you can see Johnny's going, and I'm like, oh man, I, you know. And at that point, both of our rescue divers were, and we had the first diver going in the water because right. we're figuring we're going to yeah, go we're quickly going from rescue to recover yep. real, real fast here. And Brian gets one last swing, literally at like scene out of a movie. Brian gets one last swing in, that window breaks. And I don't even know if Brian realized it broke, but it did because John, just at that point, John just felt the guy come through and John yanks this guy. And again, John's not a big guy and this was a big guy. John yanked this guy out that back window. And and for, he was underwater for about 35 seconds. John never went fully under, but he, it looked like this guy yeah. easily could have pulled him back under. And the, about 35 seconds of, of holding him, John gives him a good last grab and his head pops up and we're on the shore like oh my god did we just witness this yeah uh, i mean it literally it was it, it was it was incredible it was one of the most incredible things i've ever witnessed uh just from watching our people succeed but also just watching what we just were able to For pull sure. off and then you know and and so at that point we were able to you know get him down um we had the tower ladder there. We literally just rolled him at that point because everyone's fatigued too. I mean, this happened quickly, oh, but they're in yeah. cold water. They're in tough situations. And we, we literally took the tower ladder. And at that point, rather just to, 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 it has a lip. We dropped the tower ladder right in Long Island Sound, which some people uh, would get upset about at that point. I didn't really care. We'll fix, you know, we'll, we'll take it out of service afterwards. We'll flush it. We'll check all that. But we dropped the bucket right into the sound about a foot. Uh, got him, rolled him onto the outer lip, and the, the firefighter and it just just basically held on to him just to swing him back to shore. We dropped him off. Uh, fortunately for his sake, um, you know she was relatively uninjured, uh, right. which was great. She had you know she had some exposure issues. He had definite exposure issues, but uh, surprisingly, I mean he had some lacerations on his ears and his cheek and his and his neck from when he came through. You know there's still plenty of broken glass, uh, but he really I mean I think he was out of the hospital that later that night. But he's with, alive. Uh, alive and doing well. Yeah. yeah which is good. You know, we were 35, he was underwater for 35 seconds. And we only know that because fortunately there was a storm chaser there. One of the assistant chiefs had arrived and videotaped it. So we could check and see how long he was actually underwater. I would have put it at five seconds. You know, it didn't seem like sure. it was that long for me. Um, but you look at timing and how important a team is and all the links that come together. And, you know, did that guy have 40 seconds? Did I have 45 seconds? I don't think so. Uh, could John Calandro hold that much longer I don't think he could have you know and that's not an attack on John but we no, only so, or was right. if John held on were we going to lose John right you know which was my other fear um uh, we that's so in order to get 35 seconds to where we were you think about if anyone did anything slower if Frank Dosimo wasn't there to plow if Alessio Crenti wasn't proficient to drive the truck if Adam Full Love couldn't swing the bucket out in the way he did it was slower wasn't sure of the controls of the joystick you know if he wasn't competent there if engine twos didn't get there in the time they did and those, both of those waters didn't or both of those swimmers didn't go in the water when they did we didn't have the seconds so yeah. that truly was because i don't think we had 45 seconds to play with that's you know? incredible yeah so it, it, as the boss i mean as you know when that all gets finished and you have time to decompress what is what is that feeling for you yeah of yeah. just accomplishment and and pride and proudness well, like just what? that deep yeah. breath of Whoo. well well yeah I, of I can, course i can tell you when 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 adam got out of the bucket 
he came around. I, I remember giving him a big hug because you know incredible. first you I grabbed him. You know, it, it was right. it was a pure. I mean, you know, it was one of those moments. I just gave him a big hug. I said, I said that was one of the most incredible things I just witnessed. And I Wild. and I, at that point, I had no. I didn't realize it was the video, right? We I just had what I saw, and I, I hadn't really put it all together. So by that evening, next thing you know, you know, now there's video coming in. We realize we're watching it back, and the assistant chief brings it over to me, and we're watching it all together. I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. You know, yeah. this You know, it's actually captured on film what we just witnessed. You know, because I don't think any, if we had told the if we went back to the firehouse and told everyone about you guys wouldn't believe what we just yeah. saw, they'd be like, yeah, yeah, right. whatever, yeah. guys. Yeah, sure. yeah, sure. You I'm guys, sure it was yeah, that you, close. You guys in group two are so full of yourself. Yeah, you know, right. usual stuff. But, you know, that. at least there was uh, there was, there was was some uh, that was all recorded so we can put the story back together again. But, yeah, it was a, a pretty amazing experience. Was was this, I, I know in the notes here, it says White House visit for Medal of Valor. Was that the <clears throat> what, same call? Or? Yeah, it was. Actually, so uh, w- w- the members were all recognized. Uh, uh, one got the Medal of Valor. Uh, several got the Medal of Honor from the department, uh, which was fantastic and, and certainly deserving unit citations for a number of the companies were there, and they all they all certainly earned it. Uh, one of the things I, I did was back earlier last year, uh, I'd received notice from the IFF about this Public Safety Medal of Valor. It was an email that came, and basically the email said something to the effect of, like, look, the, the nation hands out these every year, and it's almost always – predominantly used by law enforcement and we'd like to see some more firefighters show up at this event uh so if you have events uh please submit and i had just got done writing an article for fire engineering uh on this incident and we had did a program called um, hearts of heroes and, and they had made a nice little youtube video re- recreation of the whole incident so it was kind of an easy submission for me sure. to take that because yeah. i had all this evidence i had an article i had a youtube video that was really well produced and i just wrote it up so i submitted not realizing what would happen a lot of time went by Um, But um, I knew something was going on with it because about three months before I received the final notification, uh, I had received the Department of Justice, which oversees it, had contacted me and said they needed to do background checks on everybody involved. So I kind of was like, yeah, I was like, well, that must be a good sign. I kind of you try to ask him, hey, is this a good thing? And the guy's like, well, we can't tell you, you know, usual, like, you know, very, very rigid Department of Justice speak and, you know, wouldn't tell us anything. But we knew it had to be somewhat of a good sign that something was happening. Um, But as usual, you know, you're never sure when this is going to happen. And of course, this past May, I'm sitting there on my phone and I get this, it dials up and it says Washington, D.C. calling. And I kind of joke, I'm like, oh, I wonder if it's the White House. Figuring it's going to be my vehicle. I pay my, my taxes? My, you know, or it's my vehicle warranty. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, it's right, like, right, oh, once right. again, my, right, my, right. yeah, I think that vehicle warranty thing's going to get me. So sure enough, I pick it up and it's the White House. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, cool. And they're, they're notifying me that they're getting it. And, you know, so now I got to call the three guys that were, were um, recognized and try to coax them into going. Because we've asked so much of them. I and I, I'm making a call like, guys, look, this is the last this time is, I'm going to make you go through yeah. this. But it's the White House. But and, for uh, you, it's an endorsement yeah. of your people. Like, you know, you as their leader, if you will, right? The tour commander that day. I mean, how so proud of your people that you want to promote how great they are. Well, and it's the department, too. Well, it, because, 100%. Yeah, because the, this didn't happen overnight. You know, this yes, department right. has invested right. – uh, in the training, you know, we've had a dive rescue program since the early, probably late 80s that they've had it. We've had a lot of great divers come through. And, you know, this is one of the first times where a lot of that resources, we have some really good equipment and we, the city is very good to us when it comes to providing equipment. There's not a lot when it comes to equipment that we're, that's denied of us. So the, the city pumps a lot of revenue into the fire service. And this was a great moment to share back. Hey, this is what that investment yields off. There's a man now is a 30 year old guy now who is alive when he would not if and if this not to knock other departments but if this had happened elsewhere you know it may not have you know where there was you know a delay it, it may not have had that same outcome uh so it was important to share uh obviously seeing three members go down to the white house uh i went down i was i was honored that i was i was including that there was a very hard thing to get into they just don't let you walk into yeah, the white right. house these days I'm, unfortunately some guys thought they could just show up there and like, hey, come yeah, on in no, right doesn't work that way it, it's not the white house you went to in, in middle school um but uh you know we didn't know what to expect when we got there they were very very kind of quiet on the whole format and process uh, we walked into the White House that morning, and it was like they rolled out the red carpet. They had people playing the violin, and I'm like, "Is something else going on here? Is yeah, there right. some other?" You no, know, like, "No, that's for you." I'm like, "I get out of here," you know. And they had, you know, like nice fresh lemonade, and and they had ushers for us, and it, it was an amazing experience. I mean, we had really walked into it not knowing what to expect. We didn't know if the president was going to be there. Uh, we didn't know who was going to officiate, and. Uh, uh, it, it was truly one of those things in your career, in your life, you'll never forget. Politics aside, it wasn't about politics. Yeah, or who no, you support. I support. And right, that's what we made clear to everybody. We don't care about that stuff. Uh, the department is going to the White House, and it, it was a pretty, pretty cool thing to be part of. 
So I, I, I can't it, imagine that experience of you know, un, like <laughs> pull, pulling up or walking up and being like, "Yeah, I'm supposed to be here." Uh, that, that's uh, literally yeah. and you. You didn't know when you were walking in what you're what, where, where they're going to have like a little thing by the trash cans for us, or where they're going to be, right. you know, putting. Oh, you on guys this, are the fire. You guys, yeah, the firefighters, because yeah, fire, normally just the firemen there. are usually yeah, over yeah, by we'll, like. We'll get you. Oh, we'll get you through. Yeah, them. yeah exactly. Power so, three is down yeah, the yeah, street. And, right, and yeah, right. you know, and there were several several other fire uh, fire departments represented, and several law enforcement which, who had some really incredible stories uh, of what what they were awarded for. But uh, yeah, I mean, they literally rolled out the red carpet for us. We got the here. I'm walking to the White House, and I I got my phone on me, and I'm trying to be careful but i'm yeah, trying to right. take pictures for my yeah. kids like i'm in right. the white house yeah, you know check this out. and finally there was a marine there who's in dress uniform and she comes over to me and i'm like oh, i'm done now they're gonna throw me out and uh she's like sir you can just walk in those rooms you don't have to sneak around and i was like really i could just walk in this the, just the, the library she's right. like she's like really anything on this floor you can pretty much just you have about an hour you can walk around and i literally for an hour we got to walk through the white house uh and, and go almost any i won't say almost anywhere we wanted but we really had uh, just complete access to areas of the White House that I never ever thought I'd see. It That's was cool. it was super cool. Yeah, it was it was cool. a highlight of your bonus, career. Bonus points. Yeah. If you guys talked about how you would stretch or search in there, but that's, uh, no, we yeah. did not actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think, and we got to meet the president too, which we weren't expecting yeah, to. Awesome. Yeah, so it was it was good. We got to. I mean, it was it was it was neat to see. And again, it's not about politics. It's about making sure your oh, your, your department's Absolutely. there, and it it, it it put a great light on it's the an department. An endorsement of your department. It's an yeah. endorsement of your people. Absolutely. And and the Absolutely. time and effort that's put into to do your job correctly. And, I mean, and it's just awesome. Going yeah. back to the training aspect of where this conversation happened before, like your members performed to the lowest denominator of their training that day on a high risk scenario. Mm -hmm. So that lowest denominator was pretty damn high. Yeah. Yeah. For them to be able to yeah. get that tower ladder into position, pick that woman off, get the swimmers in the water, and be able to, because there's no class in, hey, swing a halogen at a glass underwater right. as a vehicle sinking right. so they, all these things came together and it's a or how to set up your tower ladder you know on, on eight inches of snow after a high tide just might might have undermined the grass and you're right on the edge and yeah you know a lot of people challenged that a lot of people said it was a bad idea i said look you know it's it's one of those things where you know you, we'll risk a lot to save a lot. Well, when there's yeah. two people in a truck and it's going underwater, you're going to risk a lot. I, and, there's no know. reason to second guess it. Yeah. We had but zero deaths that yeah. day. That's what I would. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So. Hey, man, we got to make decisions yeah. all day long, right? Yeah, we do. We make decisions. And there's always going right. to be people who are going to question. It's okay. And you there's say. always people that don't make decisions yeah. too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we're entrusted to make them. We make them. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome, yeah. Chief. What a what an incredible yeah. highlight yeah. for your career and, and for the Stanford Fire Department, for sure. Let's talk about you just a little bit more because I know how comfortable that is for you and you <laughs> love to focus on yourself. But yeah. something I learned about so. you uh, that I did not know was this Palmer's Dollhouse. Oh, yes. So yeah. Matt Palmer, that is you. And Palmer's Dollhouse yes. is also you. It is, in fact, me. This yes. is not I'm the guy, guys. This is not uh, a guy, yeah. like, if you have a daughter and you're looking for a dollhouse for the, you know, that's not what this is. This isn't a side side hustle yeah. of making yeah. doll furniture. I mean, this is, a firefighter. Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is that training house of fire behavior, smoke behavior that we see all over the Internet these days. Um, talk about that a little bit. I find this to be a very fascinating, and I actually, in fact, just to preface this conversation, I stopped you from telling me because I wanted to be surprised by this conversation. I didn't want the background on it. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting history. Uh, it, it did not start as part of it, but it was one of those unplanned things. Um, uh, I had an opportunity to do a, a training class with PJ Norwood, who's now the director of training for the Connecticut Fire Academy. PJ does a lot of FDIC yeah. work. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. He's an old friend of mine. And he was going. We were going to do a uh, in Cheshire, Connecticut, where I used to live. We were going to do a, a training class on fire behavior for the fire department. And he was using a like a four square box at the time. And he, uh, it was a gentleman out of Washington State had been using it for years. He was he had done some evolutions with it. And he, I, I I'm kind of like a. Uh, on the side, I don't mind. I, I've, I've uh, a pretty good little shop, and, and, and I've, I'm known to have a few woodworking tools. Nice, uh, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. a joke. Everybody knows me. I, 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 sure. I, I look like Norm Ma it's a, it's yeah, like Norman right, right, right. workshop. But uh, uh, so I said, let, let me build this box for you, and I, you know, we'll, we'll build it up. And, and I had like a couple months before we did it, so I built it, and I didn't really like it. So I called him up and said, Hey, Peach, uh, you mind if I change this at all? And he's like, Oh, wait, you can't change the dimensions. I'm used to it. It's could, it could affect everything. All right, I'll keep the dimensions of the inner boxes the same, but I want to kind of do some stuff with it. So I was like, Let me play with it and he's like ah he was kind of reluctant but he goes well we'll see how it goes so i kept 
my son and I would pull it out of my garage and we'd, we'd start working on it and it's, it's OSB. So if you, you know, you make a change, well, it was OSB. I, now OSB is probably $500 a sheet, but at the time it was still, <laughs> it was still pretty cheap. But yeah. uh, so, we, you know, we could modify it, but we, I decided to put a pitched roof on it. Uh, they used to have little plugs for windows. I increased the window size a little bit and I decided to go with slides because I figured you could do some vent control with slides. Yeah, so absolutely. came up with a pr primitive way to do slides. We changed one of the windows to a bigger door so it's easier to light and it kind of ended up looking like a dollhouse right i mean you're you know not that i had one but uh you know a lot of girls would have had a a dollhouse like that so i was like oh, it kind of looks like we're building a dollhouse here so we decided to put the roof properly put some vents on there so you could simulate uh, ver vertical ventilation um and you know i didn't know how it was going to go i kept sending him pictures so that when it came time to doing the actual burn at the cheshire fire department um you know we were kind of like oh, let's let's hope this works and yeah. as it was one of the members of the fire company was video he had just got a new camera and he you know did our whole and you can go on youtube and watch the original one of of, of us doing it and it just went like it went like we had practiced this a thousand times and it went really, really well. The smoke generation was great. I mean, it worked really, really well. So what happened was that video, that guy uploaded the video. Next thing you know, it's just taken off. Exploded. And it exploded. I mean, and this is in 2015? I, it was 2015, I believe. I think it was 2015 or maybe 2016. But I think it was 15 when the first we did it. Was, it was the fall of 15. Yeah. And it just took off. So much so that PJ called me the next day and was like, you got to get those plans that you have uh onto the internet and i said i don't have plans i did this on you know so right. i so i had to basically go back and i went on and i we quickly developed about a 10 page plan that i had to design and go back and we got those out he he was connected to ul through some other work he had done um modern fire behaviors website had it and we put the plans up there for we just said Here, here's the plans if other departments want to use them go ahead and it just continued to take off and i had made the mistake but just putting my email on there and i started my email was just <laughs> lighting up with questions and ideas and hey your dimensions are wrong i'm like look you're burning this thing down you know people can i use marine grade plywood well you can but it, you know always be the yeah. part of the reason why we're using osb is because it glues in it so right. you can use hey you can use stainless steel if you want but it's not going to have the same effect so but i mean my inbox was just lit up and it was cool because at first it just started from you know tri-state area but then it started texas and california and questions and then it started you know south peru chile canada it's and you're like, oh, this reach, is, you know right? we started just keeping track and after like 200 different uh locations we're like i'm not even keeping track anymore and i'll say this to this day i still get emails today because my email is still on the original plans that are circulating through a, a bunch of different uh websites but i would still pick up you know uh, open up an email and i'll try to answer every one of them with questions and they're all they're all usually very good intended uh questions but i'm a, i mean i will tell you like guam israel germany uh south africa i'm just amazed at the reach in the number of fire departments that have picked this up and done it um los angeles city they tagged me i was logging on social media one day and i got tagged by <laughs> la city fd and it's thanking me for putting together these plans and LA does a thing with both LA City and I think LA County does as well with all the recruit classes they're broken up into different battalions right. and that's one of their projects is they have to build it as part of their assignments oh, and that's recruiting cool. time. so it's yeah, cool yeah, so yeah. I sometimes get an email from a LA City recruit asking me some questions about assembly because it's part of their project I'm like that's a pretty cool thing you absolutely know? so awesome yeah now, the, the original intent of this right yep. like the intent of building the dollhouse was for what the intent was to teach essentially teach a basic fire behavior class right if you're teaching fire one or fire two right what we have it's very much you're opening a book you're in a classroom somewhere and you're teaching a bunch of people who are brand new to the fire service just about fire dynamics smoke travel fire yep. behavior right. and you're trying so this was designed around giving a a more of a practical com component to a fire behavior class it was never ever ever underlined that five thousand times about interior fire tech but somehow some way some way it became somehow known as that we were trying to replace hose line stretching or live burns with a dollhouse fire i don't know where i mean i kind of have a good idea where it came from yeah but how that happened uh you know i'll have to let the people who promoted that theory because that was never ever our intent and now when you look at the plans it's very clear i had to go back and revise the plans it's clearly stated like over and over again this does not supplant fire live burns this is not about that this is yeah. about you know but it did unfortunately cause uh quite a commotion in the fire service that i was not expecting uh so about so from something good and value a valuable tool that was created in your driveway which has reach across the globe of course 
along with the good comes the bad. Oh yeah, there's even t-shirts. You know, they, I don't I don't think they sold too many, but uh, I even saw, and he was a friend of mine who put it out, so I won't say his name, but he, there was even t-shirts mocking it. You know, like, uh, you know, real fires, not dollhouse fires and stuff. And I was saying, well, we're not t we're not trying to take away the live burns, and, buddy. You know, that, that's not what, yeah. in any way, shape or form, what we're right, doing right, here. Right. But and that, hey, look, maybe it, the it worked The amazing thing me. is like as a fire service instructor, and like we, what we know about our our new generation of firefighters like this is a very much addressing that cognitive ability for them to learn like they get to see it they right. get to smell it they get to you know feel it yep. like so it's you're we're doing everything that we're supposed to as fire service instructors and that's the one thing that like boggles my mind about it is that, like we're hitting all these points versus a, a dull powerpoint or some slides where there's no context right. and now you get to experience this and hear it and that, and that was, it, it, it was about that classroom, right? That, that classroom was always awful to sit through. So it was just adding, adding a component that if you're teaching a fire behavior, fire dynamics class, or here's the other scenario, your public education, right? In October, we'll start to see, you know, we'll start to see a lot of pub, our community engagement, right? That's our, that's our week that we have coming up, and most of it's, we fill up the month with different activities. But think about your open houses, when the fire department wants to show even the effect of you know, close before you doze, right? That's a big campaign about trying. We see it all the time, pictures of doors open, doors closed, and a big difference. But you can use this as, a, as something for the public. So if you're gonna, ha if you're gonna have your open house, um, you know, wherever you are, you know, in Connecticut, that you can use this as your open house tool so that you can show a demonstration. It doesn't take much. It is a, it, it's an incredible vis visual representation of what occurs yeah. on a larger scale on a fire. Right. And that's all it was about. Right. right. It did somehow migrate I'm to just, somewhere else. I'm that, just floored that that came from you. Yeah. Did. And I don't mean that yeah. in, in, with no disrespect at all. I mean, like, I've always seen, I mean, for for 10 years now, I mean, yeah. you know, or, or close to it, yeah. you've seen this thing all over the Internet. And I never put that together until this morning when I was going through your bio and we're going over a couple of things. And then I was like, that was you? And you're like, yeah. yeah. And I, was I, like, I, I don't oh, I don't yeah. advertise it. Uh, no, you know, it's just a it, wild story. And I'm not normally the face of it. I mean, uh, PJ Norwood, no, I, he does I, yeah. all the a, P, yeah, PJ sure. does a great job with the sure. classes. But PJ's always the one that most of the stones were thrown at him because he was the one that was was going out and teaching yeah, the classes. He signed his name to it, right? You yeah, know, yeah. But, but it was, a, yeah, it was, you know, if you, if you look through the plans and stuff like that, but the, yeah, that was all done originally in my and, driveway. And it so. should be noted, too, that, you know, you guys put this out for the fire service. So there's no reward other That's than your personal right. satisfaction of being able to build a tool. Of this. Yeah. yeah, the millions yeah. of dollars yeah. that oh, you... Oh, yeah, yeah. The private, the private planes, I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it, Bentley outside. Oh, yeah, no, it's, with, it's, so. it's, it's lovely. You, yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I mean, look, I had some good mentors in the fire service, and, and it was a gentleman, God rest his soul, by name Eddie Amatrudo. Uh, and Eddie Amatrudo was a Connecticut fire service legend. And I happened when I was about 19, 20 years old, and I was trying to get hired and going through interviews, Eddie happened to live right down the street from me. And he literally gave me, when I say he gave me the shirt off his back, I didn't have a tie the guy gave me a tie out of his closet i still have it to this day okay no and eddie since passed on but he's one of the nicest guys you meet and was humble and he's always trying to talk about leaving the fire service a better place you found it so the way and i appreciate it, eddie gave me my footing you know probably helped me greatly first get hired by a fire department and certainly the department i'm with and so how do we honor people you know how do i honor my father who was a teacher uh, or Eddie, who was a, who was a mentor of mine, and it's like you know, put it out there. You know, I don't need to make money. So everybody wants to always monetize the fire service. We see that now with private training groups and everyone. And there's nothing wrong with it, but uh, there's no money to be made on this, anyways. I, I, there was never there was never a a business plan for, for, for the and so, but you put it out there. You try to leave the fire service better. It was an idea. You want to throw stones at me because you think I'm replacing, uh, you know, live burns. That's crazy, but that's not what this was ever about. And I and I love that that was the theme of this last hour and a half or so, was that you always want to leave it better than you found it. Absolutely. That's how we started right. this conversation today, right. and here we are still at the same point. Right. Right. I think that's so important. I think it speaks to uh, your upbringing and the influences early on in the fire service and teaching you about what this is all about. And I I love to see you pay that forward. Right. You being here today and sharing your story with us. Um, I mean, we could talk for hours and hours and, you know, it's just it's it's a testimony to the love and passion you have for firefighting. And, and I appreciate that. And thank you. Yeah. For that. No, I mean, thanks. That's, that's that, awesome. Yeah. So no. let me ask you this. This is kind of something new that I want to start asking our guests going forward. Right. There's a lot of there's a lot of negativity in some regards to how bad the job is today. Mm -hmm. We never talk about it's harder and harder to talk about how good it is because everybody always focuses on the negative. Right. We're always focusing on ourselves. We're focusing on the negative. 
you're here today talking about leave it better than you found it, and it's not about you. It's about the greater whole. Mm -hmm. What for you going forward do we need to be talking about, and how do we reach that? How do we have that conversation to still tell people how good this job is? So the problem we have is that we don't do critical thinking. And I know that sounds like a big word. It sounds like something I, I'd carry out of the NFA, but we don't. Um, we don't really, we just listen to somebody. Look, there's always a carnival barker in a firehouse, right? There's always that guy who's got a big mouth, but you got to start asking questions to quantify that. When someone says something's bad, understand why. You know, some people are empowered. You know, fear is, fear is a weapon, right? And if they make you afraid, that's their power. And it's used all over. It's used by chiefs. It's used by labor. It's used by a lot of different. It's used by politicians all the time, right? That's what. That's the nature of politics in this country, and it transcends into firehouses now. Be careful of allowing someone to make you afraid. They're always going to find a villain, so you can be afraid of them. So that empowers them. But I'd ask guys to just quantify that. Find that when someone's in it, and hold that guy accountable. When someone says the world's going to end because this is going to happen, and then it doesn't. The next time they tell you the world's going to end, hold them accountable to that because that happens every day in firehouses where there's certain people that will just try to scare you about things. So we've got to start asking tough questions of, of, of really why, if something is bad, if we're to in a toxic relationship in a firehouse, is it really justified? Maybe it is. Maybe there are places. Maybe there's a chief who's just a tyrant, and, and you know what? Then he'll come and go. You know, just like a, a mayor, they come and they go. We remain. I've, I've watched that, you know, your uncle probably told me that many, many years ago, and, and, and he's right, you know, yeah. and they, they will come and they will go, and the department will still be here. I will come and I will go, and the department will still be there. None of us are that important. But there is a toxicity that exists in the fire service, and I can't understand it because it's one of the greatest experiences that any of us will ever be allowed to have happen. Yeah. And you try to tell guys, look, when you, you know, I always look at it as it's like a, tra a train track. When you get on the job, you know, you, you get on, the train just dropped you off at the station, and all you can see in front of you is track. As far as you can see, it's like the, there's like two mountains on the side, there's a sun that's just rising, and nothing in front of you is this infinite track in front of you. And that's how you look at your career. You think it'll never end. And, you, and for most of us, hopefully, it's a long ride. But at some point, that track actually bends around. You can't see it because of the curvature of the earth, but it does come around. And it's going to come back, and you're going to get dropped off at that same station that you came in on. And hopefully for all of us, it's 35 or 40 years of bliss. But it does. And I know this. When you get off that train, when that train comes back to drop you off again, you're going to wish you were still on that ride. You are going to wish you were still on that ride because it's the greatest ride you're ever going to be on. And please, when it's over, you are going to wish. And I know so many retirees now in there that will tell you, I left too early. I missed the job. And they do. So when you're here, understand that. You know, try to make the best of it. If the chief's doing things, well, I can't always explain why they do what they do. Uh, it's usually not completely arbitrary, but you know what? That chief won't be there forever. If that mayor is giving you a hard time, that mayor will not be there forever. But yeah. the job will be there forever. It will always be there. And, you know, you're going to wish you were there. So try to not get so consumed in what one person tells you is bad. Um, because, you know, they're just trying to, you know, that's, that's their power over you. Try to be smart in that. Try to ask tough questions. And, and, you know, again, it goes back to a critical thinking process. We don't always do that in the fire service. So I, I just tell guys that that's our challenge, you know. Um, understand how good you have it because it, it is an awesome, awesome experience that we're all, that we're all part of. And uh, know that when it's over, you know, you're going to regret if you didn't give it everything you had and didn't get everything you could as far as enjoyment out of it beautiful so well i think on that note man that is just a, an incredible way to to sum up this last uh, hour and a half conversation we've had chief palmer thank you brother yeah, thanks for you know thank matt you. i appreciate um, you being here today Jeremy, making the trip down much. from connecticut to join us in the studio today um i just appreciate your friendship yeah, and, no, I, and uh today really speaking with you and getting to know you just a little bit more uh means the world and yeah I no and, I've, I've, and again i appreciate what you guys are doing because i know what you guys do involves risk too uh it yeah. does you're putting out something there and there's always someone who's going to say oh they should be talking about this or they said this and i don't agree with that but we have to share information sure. just like i mentioned sure I'm, in, I'm in a room full of chiefs and there's 12 of us and we're from every inch of the country which is by design and you know what we all do it a little differently but we all do it well and you know we can't be afraid of someone else's opinion we can't be afraid of something that jeremy says or rob says if it disagrees with us we just have to try to understand it and maybe after it kind of that seeds planted we can understand that maybe maybe it's an option for us but we seem to attack things when they're different or they're not exactly what i was always taught we can't allow that to happen you know One, and so i appreciate what you guys are doing you're sharing you. yeah. you're sharing a good fire service message and you're connecting us like we've never been connected before Beautiful. one of the that. things that i loved when and i wrote it down uh when you talked about the 
executive fire officer program and it was all across the country and i think that you know i actually listened to quarterly more this morning firehouse vigilance talk about it and how we've made the world smaller in a good way and we're we're knocking down the gatekeepers who used to be there that like had this uh you know, and sometimes it was for the good. Sometimes maybe it wasn't for the good. But like now, we freely can express and exchange information. Yeah, and I think that's incredible. So yeah, it's awesome. no, it, it's a good thing you got going here. So and and thank you, Chief. Yeah, no, I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to come down. And hell uh, yeah, man. Well, you always once once on, you always have an open invite. So we'd love so. to uh, we'd love to do more with you down the road. And um, you know, we only scratch the surface on a. 28 year career and, and we, 35 years in the fire service we, we didn't even touch fire trucks right we could talk I fire truck and, stuff all day well, so but we also have some other uh, content coming out uh, apparatus innovation stuff yeah. that i, I was going to tap you on down the road so, so we will certainly get back to that because i do know that you have an incredible love for I fire do. apparatus like i do, I do yeah, so and, yeah. and rob so yeah. uh we appreciate that but deputy chief matt palmer stanford connecticut matt thank you brother thanks appreciate guys. You yeah, being thank here. you rob Guys, thanks for tuning in for another episode of National Fire Radio's podcast. We'll be back at you next week with another episode. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be safe.